Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, today I was speaking with Bo Weingard. Bo is an evolutionary psychologist and recently he was fired from Marietta College. I don't know if you call it firing for a professor, but anyways, um, for something that was, as far as I can tell, it was nonsensical. Um, I'll link to the article that Bo wrote about uh, what happened in Quillette. Anyways, Bo, thanks for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, so yeah, like, okay, I follow you on Twitter. Um, and again, you know, like, just have this, this stupid disclaimer, like, you know, I don't agree with everything you say, but I've never found you to be <laughs> offensive or rude or you're, you're actually one of the most more measured people on that platform. And like, when I read that and I saw it, I was like really amazed, um, especially like considering, you know, the, some of the stats that were coming out, like, you know, you were like one of the more, more published people in your, in your uh, department like your reviews by your students and all that. And it just, I mean, that whole thing made no sense. Uh, yes, that makes two of us who think that it made no sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you want to walk through a bit of what happened and, like, why. Sure, yeah. So it was, I mean, my first problem started, I gave a talk at the um, University of Alabama in these dates are provisional or, or I'm not certain about these dates, but they're rough. They're rough estimates. I gave a, a, a talk at the University of Alabama late October and I gave it on human diversity, human physical diversity, but also psychological diversity. Um, when, when I was there, professors had found my rational wiki website page and if people aren't familiar with rational wiki it's yeah it's kind of this uh, left-wing vandal website that attempts to smear political opponents it says all kinds of nonsense about me um so they found this anyway they refused to meet with me they didn't have their students meet with me so i i was supposed to have all these meetings with professors and students and nobody showed up but they didn't cancel my talk which surprised me actually so I decided I was going to go give the best talk I could give to a clearly hostile audience. To the audience's credit, they did let me talk. Um, but then afterward, there was a, a rambunctious Q&A session, we'll say. Uh, people said that I was racist to accuse me of phrenology and other such things. So it was, you know, it wasn't particularly edifying. Uh, but whatever, you know, I know how students are. They get pretty zealous. So I stayed after the Q&A even and talked to students for another hour or so. And then I left. Uh, it was a little disconcerting, but I got over it pretty quickly. But then the paper there decided to write an article about it. And I actually cooperated with the author of the paper article, which was in retrospect a mistake because he clearly wasn't intending to write a fair article so he wrote an article that was very tendentious and, you know, it had like anonymous critics saying things about me that were just utterly untrue. Um, somehow somebody sent this to my bosses. I don't know who it was. Um, and so I had a meeting with my bosses after that about this incident. Oh, yeah, I should say that the um, the group that invited me actually ended up apologizing for my appearance and uh, also said that my the presentation was quote unquote non scientific, so that looks bad, obviously. Um, but but the meeting that I had with my bosses was actually not particularly uh, uncomfortable. It was actually a cordial meeting. Um, my boss encouraged me to be more strategic, if you will, and I was just trying to be agreeable. So I said sure, and but I said you know I'm gonna study controversial topics because that's what I think academics should do and I'm going to talk about these things I, I try to do so in a moderate reasonable and temper you know like temperate manner but I'm going to do it and I think that seemed to me to be the understanding and then everything was fine and then about a month and a half later when I was on Christmas break um, some pseudonymous troll started sending emails to my entire department to the president of the university or college, I guess it is, and to uh, the provost, etc., claiming that I support eugenics, linking a bunch of articles. Um, it had a, 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 a still shot of a tweet that I had deleted because people were misinterpreting it. 
I also claimed that I um, had exchanged emails with somebody who was like in a white nationalist group or something and that somebody had hacked my account and that they were going to reveal these emails that I had sent. But of course, nobody revealed them. And that's because they don't exist. <laughs> um, anyway, this this time around, though, I think people were my, my boss was clearly like disconcerted by this tweet that I had sent which again, I deleted an hour later and issued a clarifying tweet. Um, so I had a bunch of back and forth because I was on Christmas break, so I wasn't there. So there was a bunch of email exchanges back and forth. Um, I started getting more and more worried about um, my job at this point because I, I felt as though people were certainly um, displeased with me. I had a meeting when I got back from break, and I don't know when this was, maybe early February or something. But again, the meeting actually went reasonably well. Um, you know, they denounced my tweet, and I said, yeah, it was a pretty stupid tweet, but, you know, I'm going to keep tweeting. Once in a while, I'm going to say something that might get misinterpreted. If it's widely misinterpreted, I delete it. But, you know, my job is to provoke interesting conversation. That's what I think academics should do. And, you know, I tried to get some sort of explicit guidelines. You know, let's, let's champion academic freedom here. Give me some explicit guidelines. Let's work together. I didn't really get anything like that. So I didn't like that. But otherwise, I thought it was a perfectly fine meeting. There was never even a suggestion that my job was in peril. Um, nobody even talked to me about that. And then... Just like a month and a half later, I was fired. Well, I mean, people quibble about that. My contract wasn't renewed, but to be clear, I'm a, a, I was a tenure track professor, so it's it's generally assumed that unless you're remarkably incompetent or get embroiled in some kind of scandal like sleeping with students or something, that your contract is going to be renewed. So if your contract isn't renewed, it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Okay, now all of this, like everything that you're describing there, that's what I've been trying to figure out since I got back from overseas is like, when did that happen? I mean, again, I don't see anything you tweet being that horrible. You know, whatever, at least those people at Alabama, they, they came and listened to you talk and then argued back. I mean, I, I don't know how like you know, how vitriolic they were, but at least they came and listened, right? Like that should be the, the response. Yeah, I totally agree. But... <laughs> Like, I, I've been trying to figure this out. Like, I, I come back and, I mean, as far as I can taste it out, it was, like, 2013, 2014. That's when that huge shift on university campuses came around. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I've been following it, obviously, because I've been sort of in the heart of it for most of my adult life. Um, it's, yeah, maybe around there. I, I'm not 100% sure because I was a little bit isolated as a grad student because I had a great advisor who was very not politically and uh, not politically correct. And so he let me do things that other advisors probably would not have. And then when you're, when you're not so well known, you can get away with stuff that you can't when you pick up more followers and people know who you are you know yeah okay <laughs> so i think yeah so stuff that i got away with as a grad student you can't get away with it anymore but okay you you mentioned you're on a tenure track and i, I mean i follow you i follow a few other academics and i see these arguments it's like okay once you have tenure you're pretty much untouchable except for some something really egregious right yeah but the whole point of wait till you're safe and then say what you want seems to go directly against the ethos of the academy like or it should like you know like you know i look at university of chicago and that's the only one that i can kind of really say is like okay there's a good example right um mm -hmm. but like you should want to have people in the tenure track that you know will push your university push your research put, you know go out to that bleeding edge because if it's I mean, if you're just a sheep following along, like, how can they trust that someone at that, you know, once they get that tenure and have that security, how can they trust that they'll get into 
the groove of pushing the edge. I mean, wouldn't it be well, like habit forming? Yeah. So I, I mean, it's interesting because I, I I think there are problems with the way the tenure track system is set up because if the idea is to protect um, academic freedom, right, mm -hmm. then this isn't the way you would set it up because what it ends up doing actually is more protecting people who don't want to work quite so hard as they used to. <laughs> you know, you get tenure, you can kind of let things go a little bit and maybe that's okay and we can talk about that. But in terms of actually protecting academic freedom, yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't get fired for or, or relieved from your job or have your contract not renewed, even if you don't have tenure, if you're, if you're exercising academic freedom, right? I mean, that, that should start from day one, in my opinion. Once you're hired, that's the whole point of academic freedom. It's not, oh, we'll hire you and then you can wait five years and then you'll get academic freedom. Yeah. I don't think that's how the system should work. No, but, okay, also, granted, I guess they have to have some leeway. Like, you know, if I came in and I'm going to pick some something really silly and someone's going to get upset because it's probably a course somewhere, but I don't know, like, you know, like... Uh, incense making or something like that like okay fine maybe you know don't hire me as a professor and like you mm -hmm. know don't don't waste the resources of university on something like that right you know? sure <clears throat> yeah but okay so they should have some leeway there but yeah if you've yeah. hired someone in whatever department and they're actually doing you might not agree with the work but as long as the work is done being done properly right mm -hmm. you're following guidelines you're following um you know the the procedures you're following the methodology that's being set up I don't see why it's it's an issue. Like, okay, I what? I, okay, speaking of that, so some of the stuff that I think it was that got your trouble was you know, like IQ and race type of thing, right? Like, like, like yeah, that. that that probably. I mean, that was what um, troll who was sending mm -hmm. the emails to my university took exception to. So that I, I'm pretty sure that probably contributed. Yeah. Okay, now something like that. Genie's out of the bottle. You know, whatever. You can blame it on Charles Murray, blame it on whoever you want. Like, you know, like it's that genie is out of the bottle now. So if you didn't want it studied and you could have stifled it back then, great. You stifled it. I mean, I shouldn't say great, but okay, whatever you stifled it, it's not out. No one knows about it. But now that it's out, what's the point of not actually having academic work done? And then you leave it to the, you know, the race realists or, you know, like, you know, we can list off the YouTube idiots who you know, pick on this stuff, right? Like, right. why leave it to them? Once it's out right. there, isn't Agreed. it the responsibility of the Academy to have good work done on it? Well, this is, this is a point that I've made many times. And I, my answer is yes. Yes. That's what you should. I mean, you can't, you're not going to suppress these people from talking about it in a free society. And so it seems to me that it would be much better to have more reasonable, moderate voices doing serious work on it and trying to get their research into peer-reviewed journals. Um, I mean, for example, two of the articles, I mean, I've written a few pieces that were more popular pieces for Quillette on uh, human variation, but two of my major pieces, including the one that came from the material that I gave in that talk that was called, quote-unquote, non-scientific, both of them were published in peer-reviewed journals, which is exactly what a scholar is supposed to do, get articles in peer-reviewed journals, and that's what I did. And it's hard to get those articles in, so I worked hard, you know, because there's obviously you know, there's something of a bias against it. So I worked hard to get art. I mean, I got rejected many, many times and stuck with trying to get these articles into respected journals, which is what I think we should do. So yeah, I agree with you. I mean, to be clear, I don't know exactly what combination of things led to my firing because nobody told me, right? So I don't know what what amount of it was my Twitter activity and what amount of it was the stuff that I study and just what amount was the controversy that I provoke. I don't I, I don't know. But let's let's even say it was a hundred percent Twitter activity. As you've said, and I, I I recommend anybody do this, I yeah, I do I voice some 
provocative opinions on Twitter? Sure. But am I always polite and try to be judicious and have conversations with people? Absolutely. I, I don't think I've ever called anybody a name on Twitter. And I have 30 some thousand tweets. So I'm getting punished not for, you know, not for being an asshole on Twitter, which is what a lot of people do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? But rather simply for forwarding opinions and ideas. Sometimes I don't even agree with them. I'm just trying to start a conversation and say, like, let's have a debate about this, which again, I seems to me that's what academics and, and you know, I, I don't want to use, I guess, public intellectuals, whatever term we want to use for that. Seems as though that's what we should be doing. So, yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate that uh, the, si the situation's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that I know lots and lots of people who have private opinions that they're afraid to say publicly because they're afraid that these kinds of things will happen to them. And that's that's a really unfortunate situation. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's... I see that with my friends a lot. Uh, oh, I, I can't say that, you know, because... And some of it's like, okay, I speak out against Islam and they're like, oh, well, you know, I want to say that, but I can't because I'm white. I'm like, uh -huh. uh, yeah. You know, like, Say what the hell you want to say, and okay, I don't know how much it's going on here, but I've seen it in the UK, and I might have seen it at a couple of universities here, like I, like from the college fix or something, saying, you know, report people who say microaggressions, like basically having like you know, citizens yeah. reporting on each other, and it's like yeah. it, it, like I used to I visited, you know, the communist bloc when it was still the communist bloc, right? Uh huh. And I, I I've worked in Afghanistan, I've worked in Sudan, I've worked in like go you know, former Yugoslavia. Like, I, I get those kind of like, you know, that that's the feeling from there. Like, you know, yeah, like, you're afraid of your neighbor, you, you don't know who you can trust. Like, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, it's that co you know, it's that collective ignorance, right? Like, you don't know who's a true believer and who's not. And even mm -hmm. if a lot of the people aren't true believers. It only takes one. So you're always worried about that. You know, it's interesting, though, in my situation, um, the the college that I was at, or I guess I'm still there for the end of the semester, um, the students are great. There really isn't this kind of culture on the campus. It was totally an administrative decision. And I, and I think it was just, it was something where people were bowing to pressure that really they didn't have to bow to. So it's a, it's a weird thing. It's not as if there was some kind of like grassroots movement led by students who were outraged about me or something. Um, I mean, even if they were, that's no reason to get rid of somebody because students should be challenged. But I have, I've never had problems with students. I mean, I've had a few at Florida State where I was a grad student. I taught there. I, you know, I had a few students write a comment or two that, you know, they, they thought I was controversial or something. But by and large, I've had fantastic experiences with students that I've taught in classes. It's the, the problem here was completely administrative. And I think the administrators, in some sense, are in the same position that you were talking about with the communist bloc, where they're actually afraid, too. You know, they're afraid that this will really hurt their bottom line. And, you know, let's be clear, the bottom line of a university or college is not to promote academic freedom. It is to get tuition from students, right? I mean, that that's what they're going to ultimately what they care about. Um, and so I think they they worry about what what is this going to do to our college's brand name. Although it seems to me that if you look around, um, a lot of these colleges that have had meltdowns, Evergreen State comes to mind, mm -hmm. um, they've actually been hurt. To Their tuition, their bottom line has been hurt because they went too woke. Yeah, but, okay, that too, like, they, they, they're they going, like, you know, like you said, they're losing uh, admissions, they're losing money, uh, mm -hmm. but they're going to blame that. Like, I, I've read enough of this stuff now that they're going to say that that is proof of the white supremacist, you know, patriarchy, blah, blah, blah. And sure. if they did well, they're going to say, well, see, we're fighting back. This, like, no matter what happened, that was proof of their point. 
Um, but like these universities, okay. Again, when I first got came back, I was trying to figure out what the hell's going on because I'm seeing, um, you know, the Christakis is at Yale. There was at Mizzou there. She was the journalism professor, and mm-hmm. you know she's calling for muscle to take away yeah. students. Okay, yeah. and like you know, like all that kind of stuff. And then you know, yeah. uh, Middlebury with Charles Murray, Sarah Lawrence recently, like all these things. Yeah, and I was just like, okay, what's going on here? Um, but yeah, like when you look at it, it is the administration. And I, I've, I've come up with a, okay, I don't know how tinfoil haddish this this theory is, um, but it's. Uh, like I looked at all, like I started reading a lot of this stuff. So I, I did my bachelor's in uh, the late eighties, early nineties. Um, so I, you know, I got some postmodernism there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I started reading like the critical race theory stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I'm like, okay, that stuff became fields in the mid nineties, roughly like early nineties. People started getting out with, uh, you know, master's level and maybe some doctorate level stuff in the 2000s started coming into uh, internships, junior positions, middle management. By the time Obama comes around, these people have moved up mm-hmm. and more and more departments are being made, more and more uh, things are going at HR, more and more policies coming out. Um, mm-hmm. When I'm looking at like the College of Educations in the States, that's mm-hmm. getting into there. So it's yeah. like they were, you know, like, whatever, basically, it's like, you know, they take it out of the times or now, it was like a virus. Like, it just started multiplying and going through everything. Yeah. No, I don't think that's tinfoil. <laughs> I don't think that's tinfoil at all. I mean, that's just, like, a pretty straightforward, I don't know, like, structural analysis, right? Which is, I mean, Christina Hoff Summer go, Summers goes over this in the book, Who's Told Feminism? And, and feminism happens a little bit earlier, like second wave feminism, where you get, yeah, these are the people who went through and learned all of these theories in the 60s and 70s, and now they're administrators. And so maybe with race, postmodernism, it gets a little, it's a little bit later, but now they're administrators. And yeah, I mean, it makes sense that if they've imbibed these theories, and, and a lot of them, maybe, maybe they believe them, maybe they don't, I don't know. I, I, I think in I think in some cases, it's just actually that they worry about reputational damage, and then in some cases, it's that they're true believers, right? So it's hard to know how much is driving any particular uh, case of um, the crackdown on academics or academic freedom or anything that happens on a campus, you know, where like the Yale campus, I mean, the Missouri one, all of these kinds of events, it's hard to know exactly how much of it is true belief and how much of it is just concern about reputation. I don't have a good theory of that either. Yeah. I don't have, you know. But, again, I just keep coming back to this, like, and you mentioned it a few times yourself, like, if you're on a university, shouldn't mm-hmm. your reputation be, yes. you know, should <laughs> good pro- like you know, like the product yes. of a university is good academic good academia yes. like good you know, like, agree so a hundred percent agree now okay I this is maybe getting this is definitely out of your you know your field or whatever but I'm looking at the high schools now and I'm like I like I said I was really looking into this stuff because I got concerned I think it's 16 states uh, I'd have to double check my numbers but it's three provinces in Canada for sure like K through 12 they're teaching critical race theory uh really yep uh, wow. I, can, I can send you curriculums Ooh. uh seattle school districts k through 12 math maths is being taught through an ethnic lens yeah i saw i i did see that i i, okay. I don't i didn't read <laughs> it thoroughly enough to to know exactly what was going on there but it was a, it was disconcerting yeah yeah uh new york's new york city schools uh, some of them were talking about teaching kids as young as pre-K things that like being on time is acting white. Yeah, yeah, that's a weird. That is such a weird thing. Okay. Like now, I'll tell you what. Seriously, I had this when I was in grad school. I was talking to a friend about they they had this um, this thing where you would um, garden. 
so so people would garden and there were african americans who were doing this and he was explaining my friend who was very liberal was explaining to me that because of this legacy of slavery the african americans don't show up on time because they they see that as being like imposed by the white master and like we we should just kind of be okay with that and i was like isn't that like very condescending to think that another person should like can't handle showing up on time and just doing work the way that anybody else will you know what i mean like that's such a bizarre attitude okay i find okay like the whole thing like uh that's acting white like uh, a friend of mine um sarah Hader. i don't know if you know who she is Uh, i'm familiar with her on twitter yeah yeah. so she did a thread on intersectionality Mm -hmm. and i mean sarah is again really measured person yeah and she oh she said okay here's what i think it got you know what uh, crenshaw got right here's what i you know but here's where i think it went off the rails and she talked about you know how it misses out at the margins that it talks about right Mm -hmm. and she ends up being called like she's being told oh you're talking white you're sounding white you're acting white the first thing i can think of when i see things like that is i remember back to like the 60s and whatever and it's like oh you're you know they're getting all uppity you know like they're they're and it's like and that's exactly what it is but it's being done in the name of anti-racism and it's like, but you're acting just like the bigots. Yeah, you, and yeah, I agree. It's like, it's, in fact, it's like a very, isn't it sort of the essence of racism to suggest that if you act a certain way, you're somehow not your own race anymore? Or that there is a way to act according yeah. to your race. Like, yeah, exactly. And, I mean, yeah. some of the stuff I see coming out now, like, uh, oh, well, if you weren't... Uh, if you if your family wasn't here through slavery or if you're not of an african descent you don't have the real black experience in america oh really okay yeah yeah I okay i'm like and this is coming out again from like critical race theorists and some of it's right. like post-colonial stuff some of the stuff right. from post-colonialism like i'm reading now and i don't know how new it is new to me anyways that the slaves that were brought over were help helped the colonial the colonialist powers make money and so because the slave labor was helping the colonialists they were part of the genocide of the of the natives americans wow okay now that's something else yeah yeah no no i mean okay <laughs> now my whole thing is if you are so concerned about a white supremacist regime right mm-hmm. the united states is what about 65 percent white roughly yeah something like that okay. now uh, why would you want to divide up that other 35 percent into even smaller yeah. groups and have them like fight with each other i know like, like, like what's the point of this stuff <laughs> it is odd but I, I mean i think that's kind of it's it's uh almost like uh an olympics of victimhood right yeah. I, I mean i think um there are funny things in some of these books i've read like the like, the who stole feminism by hoff summers mm-hmm. she goes over some of these uh these feminist conferences she would attend where they would end up breaking apart and bickering about like who has more who's more of a victim right so it'd be like well we're lesbian handicapped i I don't know if you're supposed to use that term anymore Uh, if you're not i apologize but we're you know we're lesbian uh women who are not fully abled or whatever the term would be and so we deserve our own category right and you're right like it's it's weird because they end up breaking (laughs) apart and bitter disputes with each other instead of as you know i mean if you really cared about these things you would think what you would try to do is work together as a group and overthrow the white supremacist society or whatever it is that your goal is I, i don't know i don't I haven't, it was really weird because when I was first introduced to these theories that you're talking about, and I'm not an expert on Mm -hmm. any of these, by the way, but I was in literature, uh, literary studies. That's what I wanted to go into. And this was in the late 90s, early 2000s. I just thought this stuff was completely silly. I couldn't believe that it was something people did. And I didn't know that it had real world effects. You know what I mean? Like, I just thought this stuff is just preposterous and silly. And 
I don't really take it seriously and probably nobody in, in the place that actually matters takes it seriously. But it turns out that people do take it seriously, un- uh, apparently. Uh, yeah, okay. It's, uh, okay, I don't, like, uh, Benjamin Boyce in Washington State, he's been following it. Yeah. Like, he, yep. I don't yep. know if you saw what he put out about Washington State, their new Office of Diversity there. No, I didn't. I oh, yeah. Uh-oh. Yeah, like... Uh, they, or they, is it Everett State? You no, mean? no, no, no. Washington State, like, the, the government. Oh, really? Yeah, the government now oh, has an... They have an Office of Diversity. And one of their jobs is to make sure that all the other government departments are diverse. Really? And, and then uh, then I think your wow. Congress in the States just passed an Office of Diversity. And wow. Canadian yeah. government... Uh, in December, renamed the Ministry of Multiculturalism to the Ministry of Diversity, Inclusion, and Youth. And one of their mandates is to form an anti-racism secretariat, specifically anti-black racism. And Mm. they are also to ensure that all policies and all government departments make sure uh, sure that all of their policies and every single governmental department policy that comes out Mm. follows a gender-based analysis plus. So intersectionality. Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. So, uh-huh. um, yeah, people have been worrying about church and state, uh-huh. but they forgot about the wall for dogma and state, because in Canada, dogma yeah. is now part of state. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Well, I'm, I, I just like a small example of that. During the Biden-Sanders debate, well, I think he said this before it, but this was the first time I saw it. Biden said he will nominate a woman of color I think he said a black woman. No, Bernie said a woman of color and Biden said a woman. Well, he's now said a woman of color for the Supreme Court. Oh, for the Supreme Court. Sorry. Yeah, I, Supreme I, I, Court. I, I thought you meant the VP. Yeah, no, no. So, but he, well, he did say a woman for VP, too, mm-hmm. but the, the woman of color one for the Supreme Court. I thought that is pretty much textbook racism. Is it not to say, you know what, I'm going to. I'm going to put a candidate on, but I'm not going to pick the most qualified one. I'm going to pick one that that checks off two demographic boxes that are important. It's just like a weird thing. Like if I were running for president and I said, I'm going to put a white man on the Supreme Court, you can count on it. People would rightfully denounce that as obviously racist, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to kind of pull this back to um, your situation and then... Sure. All the all the insanity that's going on right now with the the COVID nineteen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So like with all that that's going on right now. Mm-hmm. Um. And I've seen a couple articles that are really stupid, but uh, I don't I don't even want to really talk about them. But <laughs> the need for expertise has become so apparent, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, granted, you're doing evolutionary psychology, but sure. you know, you can read data. You've got Maybe there's something you can lend. I don't know. At the rate I've seen universities shed off, you know, smart people, whether I agree w- w- with those people or not, they're obviously intelligent. They're obviously, you know, do know they know the work in their field. Mm-hmm. Like a time like this, should it show to university like you know we might need these people? Like society in itself, like even if not the university, like it's yeah. I mean, I agree with you. And actually, like, attacks on expertise, to be fair, come from both sides, right? Oh, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I I don't like it. Now, I think probably, to be fair, you don't get so many problems in, in fields such as chemistry and physics as you do in the social sciences because, one the uh the results are just more tangible right it's easier to see that like this person's really productive this person's not this person's a genius this person isn't and also because you're studying molecules or you know the way objects fall you know Mm -hmm. things that aren't sacred to humans the way social sciences you're studying humans human nature human behavior and we have like very strong sacred values about humans um that we get worked up about I think we lose more talent in the social sciences at the academy than we do in in some of these other fields. Thankfully, by the way, because you're right, I I know a lot of people who are not in the academy, who are very bright, very interesting thinkers, who have been 
basically who are victims of the regime of political correctness that now reigns. And that's really unfortunate. My hope is, and you can see this, you you brought up Benjamin Boyce, for example. Um, There are lots of people, more and more people, who are sort of independent academics, if you will, who are not affiliated with any particular university anymore. And I think they feel more free to speak openly about issues, etc. And that's a good thing. Uh, You know, we can't replace the education that they get from universities. And that's unfortunate. But you brought up University of Chicago, which has dedicated itself to academic freedom. There are other places, Hillsdale College, for example, in Michigan, is very good about these issues. Um, So my hope is that there'll be sort of a a market correction in which some universities will figure out that a bold proclamation in defense of academic freedom and and keeping these talents will be advantageous in the long run. And that sort of bowing to the pressure, to the temporary immediate pressure of social justice types is actually in the long run damaging. That's my hope. Sticking with this for a second, like you said, okay, we got no other option. But what if, with looking okay, now, you know, everyone studying from home, a lot of people working from home, mm-hmm. like if I had a, a virtual reality company, right mm-hmm. now I'd be working on a VR classroom. Yeah. Okay. Like if you can, like, because virtual reality is getting better and better. Now I know, mm-hmm. like, I've seen a lot of professors, and I can understand that, like, doing a video thing, like a Zoom call or whatever, is not perfect for a classroom thing. But yeah. if it is a VR thing, where you're kind of seeing other students sitting down, the teachers, uh-huh. you know, the professors acting like they normally would, just walking around, sitting, or whatever they would normally do, right? Right. You're there. I mean, it's, it's yeah, you don't have the physicality, but it's pretty much the same thing. Like, you know... If- yeah, I mean, I'd have to see the, 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 the how good the virtual reality is. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, people have been talking about this in education for a long time, right? Like, how are we going to make education more efficient? And, you know, I was just thinking about like, well, if you have a very gifted lecturer, why wouldn't you want thousands of students to pay attention to that lecturer instead of reducing it to 20 students or whatever it has to be because of the the actual limitations of the physical classroom? Um, but you you do hint at, you you know I think you allude to the, to part of the problem which is and and I don't have I, I have no interest anymore because I'm not a professor mm-hmm. anymore so I'm not I'm not sort of self interested mm-hmm. here but I think there's a pretty big there's something irreplaceable about being in the presence of the students and interacting with them one-on-one or whatever. You're right, though. If the virtual reality, if it gets better, that will be something that probably some places can take advantage of. And there are already sort of alternatives online, I think. Like, um, I can't think off the top of my head of any of the names, but you're right. There there will be alternatives. You're right. And, and some of those you know, as the technology gets better, they will be more feasible. And and maybe that, maybe a good thing about that is not only will it provide alternative avenues for students and academics, but also it will put pressure on the universities and colleges that exist now, and they'll have to, like, sort of adjust to that. That's my hope. But I mean, also, like, if you can do it that way, and, mm-hmm. and obviously, like, I'm not talking about this happening, you know, Right. Like within like the next even maybe five years, but sure, you know, but that would like cut down costs. I mean, if you can do it from yeah. your house and you got to buy a VR set or something, like you know, yes, you know, again, maybe hopefully not necessarily with this, but if the universities start realizing, you know, the problems with all the social justice stuff, the problems mm-hmm. with, and okay, the right wing stuff too. There was I, I'm trying to remember the name of the professor who recently got fired because he made a Facebook post about, uh, oh. Iran says they're going to blow up uh, American uh, historical landmines, you know, landmarks. Oh, I better go to the TGI Fridays or something. Something stupid like yeah, that, right? That. Yeah. yeah. And he got fired. And that was like a right wing thing. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, but if if enough universities left and right were doing this kind of firing people for saying stuff that they don't like, mm-hmm. I mean, part of the problem there is administration costs are what's driving up a lot of the fees, as far as I can tell. 
I mean, yeah. if you if you cut out a lot, if you cut out a lot of that bloat, you could yes. cut down costs of universities. Yes. So if you can start doing more virtual things, yes. I mean, I think it's going to force them to shed some of this bloat and shed the fat and you know bring down the costs. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I hope that that's true because I, I, what I see in, in a lot of these colleges, especially these liberal arts colleges, is they're essentially very, very expensive babysitters for kids, right? You know what yeah. I mean? Because these, kids, a lot of the people, they would benefit from internships or other kinds of educational opportunities they're not going to be liberal arts scholars and it's a waste of their money and i see this all the time and it's it's really unfortunate because it's expensive it's really expensive and you're right i mean if there's a way to avoid that and i mean like that's why all of these you know, diversity uh, groups on campuses, these bureaucracies that get bloated. And, you know, you have lots of people making pretty good salaries just doing these things that are utterly inconsequential or perhaps even pernicious, as far as I'm concerned, that goes into the tuition, right? That's yeah. something that makes college cost more for people. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that there are these kinds of things and that I don't want college to get annihilated or anything, obviously, and neither do you, but like, I do want it to get a kick in the ass so that it has to adjust, you know, in some sense to. Yeah. But I mean, if they can work like, okay, even a place like Harvard or whatever, like you know, a, a big school, mm -hmm. I mean, offer, like if, if this technology becomes available, mm -hmm. they can do themselves a world of good by offering those things as well, like you said, to get more students. I mean, I, I guess at one point there is diminishing returns. Like a professor speaking to, you know, 100 students instead of 20 might be doable, but 1,000 might be, you know, way too much, right? Like for, yeah. for, for, for yeah. like one lecture or something. But, right. you know, so like, I, I think if they, you know, I think if this stuff goes forward and then people start working on it, uh, you know, universities will have to adapt otherwise they're just going to go by the wayside yes yeah, All right, yeah well, I i'm going to completely pivot again because I, I got my answer this to you a little bit earlier was um if maybe you can give me uh your your take on this and again this this might be a completely uh out there theory um cool so okay like with the covid 19 right like mm -hmm. everything that's going on now um yep a, if you want to talk about the isolation a little bit but if you're seeing like the pictures of Okay, the only way I can describe them is those idiots down in spring break, and there's just <laughs> yeah. there's people in like Bondi Beach in Australia and stuff. Yes. Okay, my little you know, uh, Lucy uh, Lucy from the Peanuts shrink, uh, you know, psychological analysis of this is, it's the flight fight or flight gone into overdrive. Right now, hiding is actually fighting, but we're trying to convince yeah. ourselves that. You know, like these people are letting their baser instincts take over and they're in fight mode and they want to fight it. Whereas actually running away is the fighting. Yes. Yes. That's, I, I think that's, and so I think it's, you know, it's complicated the, the, the sort of causes behind some of this behavior, but I think you've absolutely nailed it on a certain subset of it at least. And I saw this with the Nashville I don't remember who it was who tweeted this, but she, she wrote Nashville undefeated. And it was these people in this bar yeah. or something, you know, just all next to each other, breathing on each other, dancing, etc. And I think the idea was, you know, F you virus, we're not afraid of you. But it's like, no, that's not how you fight a virus. The way you fight a virus is you do social isolation, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's this weird thing where, this, this sort of image of, you know, the way we win is we're not afraid and we don't change our lives, but actually, no, that's the way you lose, right? The way you win is you actually, you listen to your fear and you're like, okay, let's stay inside for a while or whatever. I mean, like, obviously these things are complicated, right? So it's like, I, I'm, I'm reading a bunch of experts and I'm trying to do what, what they're saying is best. I'm not an epidemiologist, but 
it does seem as though most experts have converged on the idea that we have to at least flatten the curve so that we don't overwhelm the health system, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, another thing I think about this, I'm like, I've asked myself this a lot, like, how would I respond to this if I were 19? I doubt I would have, like, a, a remarkably mature response to this. Because I'd be like, who gives a shit? Like, I'm out of school, cool, sweet, you know, I don't have college, or maybe I'm doing it online or whatever. And, you know, the death rate for 19-year-olds is virtually zero. And it's hard to understand at that age when you have your, your brain isn't quite matured yet and you don't have the wisdom that you get with age. Um, it's hard to understand that your behavior has a lot of, potentially negative consequences for people who are older than you are, who are in their 50s or 60s and have various comorbidities and are, are much more threatened by this. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a combination of things. And I, I don't, I don't want to be, too, it's like, I, I don't know the best way to handle it, because I don't want to be too critical of, I mean, you want to shame people to a degree to get them to do what they should do. On the other hand, I, I'm sympathetic insofar as I recognize my 19 year old self in those people. I mean, I, I wasn't out partying when I was 19, but I, I can understand being like, Oh, I'm not going to listen to this or whatever, or not taking it terribly seriously. Yeah. I mean, okay. The people that, okay, like you said, shaming whatever, but it's like, that just came out about those. Um, where was it? I think it's three now for sure. There was uh, one Democrat and two Republicans who profited, so, yes. who profited off that. Okay. Now yeah. that is, again, your baser instinct. I'm going to save my ass. I'm going to save my money yeah. or whatever. Right. Yeah. But their, their responsibility is the people. I mean, that's their job, right? Like that's what they're, that's what they're supposed oh, yeah. to be doing. Yeah. That strikes me as truly despicable. I, yeah. I mean, that's, I have much more sympathy for a 22 year old who's partying than I do for somebody who is pretending everything's okay publicly, but privately knows that there is great cause for concern and is using that instead mm -hmm. to make profit in the marketplace or in, yeah. in, in the stock place. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, like, like, you know, but yeah, I mean, there, there's two different levels of it. There's, you know, the, the, whatever, like you said, the, uh, the, the 19 year old, which okay, I saw that, like I was, you know, I was in war zones. I was in Afghanistan for close to seven years and mm -hmm. most of the soldiers are, you know, 19 to 25 you know for the most part right and yeah i mean there's a lot of stupid stuff going on the bases even <laughs> though like they know that tomorrow they're going out on patrol or whatever right it's right, right. you know it's you know like for them it is a little bit of fatal fatalistic like yo you don't know when you're gonna go your time's gonna come and it's you know live every day like it's gonna be your last because one day you'll be right right you know? right right so Okay, I think the like I said, I think those people are idiots, and you know, like I might have, I probably retweeted a couple of things where you know people were like, look at these morons, but oh, I did too, yeah. yeah but I kind of, I get you know, I, I I get what you're saying as well. Like I understand that, you know, that that 19 year old in in that like that moment of there's an actual real threat to your life. Like I mean, you know, this or being in a war zone or whatever. There's actual real threat to your life. Um. But sorry, I'm just gonna ramble for a second here. Like this, this stuff too. Like at this moment, again, going back to what happened to you, and then when I look at the media, uh, I mean, the media, like the, the term fake news, I think is stupid. I, it's more narrative-driven news from both sides. And mm -hmm. if you follow the the whole COVID thing, right? When Trump mm -hmm. first did the okay, I'm gonna do a travel ban against Chinese, which I think was silly because you should have just done like okay, you're gonna close the borders, period, right? If you were to do that, that's the step you take. But yeah, well, Trump's overreacting, and that's coming from you know New York Times, Washington Post, blah 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 blah, and yeah. then all of a sudden it switches to no, he's not doing enough, and it's just like okay, yes. yeah, no one at a time like this, the media has lost so much trust in itself, yes, that no one knows who to listen to, and that yeah. I think is adding to a lot of the uncertainty and a lot of the fear and everything that's going on. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's true. Also, it, it contributes to people not taking the threat seriously for a period of time when they probably should have, right? So, um, yes, you're right. I, I was looking at some of the articles that were, and in fact, even um, 
uh, various pundits on MSNBC who were who were chastising Trump for the the travel ban or whatever the chi- specifically the China one, uh, but then who quickly turned to Trump's not doing enough. He's mm-hmm. making light of this. It's you know like he's not taking it seriously, um, and yeah, people people because it's so partisan, people get you know, they don't trust anything that comes from the other side. And that's worrisome to me. Although I've actually, if we could, I mean, we could maybe tilt a little bit and focus on some of the positive. There's been interesting because you see Tucker Carlson, yeah, who has been absolutely, in, in my opinion, quite good about all of this. Uh, and, you know, most people would probably have called him like a Trump lick spittle or something. And yeah. he's in fact... You know, no, okay, no, there are good points. There are, okay, like, I go, yo, credit where credit is due, but that's the problem, I think. Like, if you were, you know, fully anti Trump, mm-hmm. even if Tucker Carlson is giving right information, oh, it's Tucker Carlson, it's Fox News, I'm not yeah. going to listen, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's about it. Yeah. And, yeah. and vice versa. Like, yeah. there's some great people at the New York Times. You know, yes. Like, but if you're, you know, on the opposite side, oh no no, it's New York Times, fake news, right? Yep. Like, yep. therein lies the problem. These little, yep. these people who are actually doing good work at this moment are yep. being lost. You know, they're being it's throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? It's just yeah, yeah, totally, totally agree. I mean, I think that's one of the serious problems with hyper partisanship and hyper polarization is that when something actually happens that's serious that really matters people don't trust 50 to 70 percent of the news sources out there so like during the cultural war when it's every you know we're pretty peaceful affluent we don't have many concerns okay fine you can yell and signal and get angry about this or that and not trust this or that and the consequences aren't terribly high now they are. Now they are. There's serious consequences. And yeah, you're right. I mean, there's a lot of skepticism and distrust, and that's really unfortunate. Um, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that this brings people together. And maybe I'm being stupidly optimistic here, but here, here's something to think about. Th- this has caused me some optimism. There really isn't a lot of pushback on the idea that we need to work together to make sure that people have money and that we take care of them during this incredibly trying economic situation. And and that's been nice to see. You don't have, I mean, I thought you would at least get a little pushback from what was left of the sort of free market GOP crowd that would be like, no, that's not how we handle things. But Really, there hasn't been. There's been a lot of... There, there, there was some yesterday from Pelosi because she was trying to push back against Trump's, uh, like, UBI-type scheme, right? She was okay. trying to... And that, okay, and that was just specifically because she wanted to stop Trump. It's like, okay, yeah. yeah, it's idiotic at this point. And again, I agree with you. Like, I, it's one of the things I noticed overseas, um, especially, like, in Afghanistan and Sudan, which were the real hotspots that I was in... Um, mm-hmm. The generosity of spirit, like if someone, you know, like you're like I worked in IT, the section I was in, if someone there received a care package from home, you know, they shared it with everyone. We mm-hmm. all because we knew we were in a common situation. We all knew what we were in. Right. So mm-hmm. there was there and you're seeing it now, like you're seeing like those distilleries that are making hand sanitizer. Uh, yeah. I've seen hotels that say, OK, you know what? We've closed down, uh, but we're going to let healthcare workers or hospitals send people here for isolation like there's a lot of this stuff going on yeah. everywhere yeah and yeah okay yes you are going to get the assholes and they're going to be there all the time but i think it's yes. less and less of that and i think more and more people are showing that yes we can get together and hopefully you know you come out of this and okay i'm always been a free market person i've never even when i was a kid i never flirted with communism or socialism or anything like that um <laughs> but I, okay, I live in Canada, so I understand, you know, uh, I had a kidney removed because of a tumor. You know, it didn't cost me much. It cost me like 35 bucks a day for the hospital room. And that was for a few days. That was it. You know, like, yeah, you know, well, like, yeah. so I appreciate socialized health care. But I also appreciate the fact that we did open up a private uh, stream if you wanted to. Yeah. But, but the private stream also is somewhat regulated in how much they can charge. 
Right? Uh-huh. Uh, like they, you know, like a visit to a, a GP can't charge you. They can't charge you a thousand bucks or something, right? You know, like right. Uh, so maybe some more blended economies where you have a free market system, but you have good strong social nets will come out. You know, I'm, I, 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 that's what I'm inter- I'm interested to see the sort of political changes that this uh, brings. Because you're right, I think there will probably be a move toward and and like you i'm i'm a huge fan of markets but i also think yeah i'd i'd be a fan of some sort of universal healthcare system you know like whatever the details of that i mean it's complicated problem but um i think people will move toward those things at least for the near future as Mm -hmm. as we see like as the because one thing about this crisis right is that it doesn't it it seems so, so the 2008 financial crisis it was easy to blame it on people who were doing irresponsible things people who were taking loans that they shouldn't have taken uh elites who were taking risks that they shouldn't have taken and so i think there the bailouts were more controversial because people did have a legitimate argument that you shouldn't bail out these people who took these kinds of irresponsible risks whereas this one is different because it's just a force of nature nobody behaved irresponsibly in the economy to bring this upon us right well, some some companies did like well, uh, okay. yes. no 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 uh, like the airlines uh boeing okay just just one example of this they yeah. spent something like uh 58 million dollars buying back their own shares yes okay yeah. Uh, or I, maybe I have the number wrong. Maybe it's, uh, it was a it was billion, not million. I don't know. I, I'd have to look at the number again. You know, yeah. uh, Mark Cuban actually put that out. He's like, a lot of these companies that they're asking for bailouts had spent the last couple of years buying back shares. He's like, yeah. if you want to give a bailout, stop that kind of stuff, which I which I agree with, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, you know, you have to have the ability to buy back some of your shares, but sure, you know, like, are you going to learn to have yourself a war chest? Like, if you didn't learn in two thousand eight, why are you going to learn now, right? Like, yeah, yeah. So that's that's fair. That's fair yeah. criticism, and and so you, yes, you would have to look at you know each unique situation of, of yeah. each of these sort of corporations or whatever. I mean, I mean, I think I think most people will agree when it comes to smaller businesses, right? That yeah. we have to work together. You know, the, oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. But I'm talking. Yeah. Like you know. Like okay. But even like let's say a chain like Marriott, right? It's a chain of hotels. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, they're going to lose a ton of money in it. Yes. If they've acted responsibly, and then there's you know, Chain X that hasn't acted responsibly, mm-hmm. you know, Marriott should is more deserving of a bailout than the company that was acting irresponsibly before this happened. Sure. You yeah. Know, I mean, like, yeah. I'm not saying let them let them die out and screw right. all their employees or whatever, but right. you know, right. if you've got you're gonna have a limited amount of money, obviously, and I think the people who did a better job at pre- protecting themselves from this stuff should be given a bigger share of a bailout than people who didn't. Yeah, I think that's like a, a morally principled uh, attitude. Uh, w- one thing I've thought about, you know, the idea of creative destruction and, mm-hmm. um, you know, people who are more on the libertarian side often emphasize this. One problem with that or one limitation of that is that the people who end up getting absolutely destroyed during the creative destruction phase are ordinary workers, right? So it's really, it's this complicated thing, right? Because, like, remember in 2008 or nine when there was debate about bailing out the auto industry, especially in Michigan, mm-hmm. in the United States here, um, and a lot of people argued against it. And I understand those arguments, but the problem is the people who are going to be hurt if the auto industry goes belly up, it's going to be ordinary workers there, right? The people who took the risk and made mistakes with the way they ran the auto industry, they're probably going to be just fine even if the thing collapses because they'll get some kind of golden parachute or figure out some way to make it. So it's really hard just to be like, yeah, they should fail and fine. Because yeah. in, unless we figure out a way, a good way to to allocate money to workers in the meantime who need it, and I mean there, there's uninsurance or uninsurance, unemployment. Excuse yeah. me. 
there are various ways of trying to help there. But yeah, okay, and again, maybe you know, this is like this is just me talking. Obviously, I'm not an economist or anything like that. But you know, okay, if you do bail them out, like add certain conditions to it. Okay, you're going to pay a higher interest rate. Because, sure. Yeah. Okay, you know, yeah. Absolutely. That's a, that's a penalty, right? Like that's not um, or here for the next five years you can't buy back any shares or whatever like just yeah. you know yes or you you, know, you have to invest in more yeah. infrastructure yeah. instead of stock or what, yeah. whatever it might be yeah yeah, yeah. no so, I, I mean, I, that's yeah okay that there you can put conditions on and that is again they're yeah. getting the money right away but that's further down the road it's they've got less money or there goes was more a little bit more punitive or something but yeah you know you shouldn't reward bad behavior yeah, agree, agreed with that principle. You shouldn't, and, and to the extent that you can figure out a way of not rewarding it, yeah. and, you know, as lots of people say, not letting things be too big to fail because that's a problem that obviously creates a moral hazard. If I know that you're not going to let me fail, I can take risks that other people can't take. Um, yeah, I completely agree with that. Right. Well, I don't want to keep you too, too long, but uh, I was going to ask if you had... Any thoughts about what people can do to not go insane while they're staying isolated? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Um, I don't, and I'm lucky because, as I said, I'm very introverted. So you're right. Like, there's something about that usually when you're an introvert and you're inside, you're like, well, I could go out if I had to. And that sort of safety button feeling um, is, is somehow uh, soothing. But... Um, this isn't that bad for me. It's more, it's more bad because I'm a health, like a neurotic. So that, that's the scarier part for other people. I really don't know. I, I don't, I've been trying to figure that out too. And, you know, reading and binging on shows that I enjoy and playing chess online, uh, <laughs> like Skyping people, I guess. I mean, all of these things that, that technology allows us to do to stay in contact with people and not feel completely alone and alienated. Probably, probably those are good things to do. Yeah. I mean, that's what I, I suggested to a couple of friends, like, uh, set up like a, you know, like a Google hangout and have a dinner. Yeah. So, you know, like you put your computer and, you know, you eat in front of your computer and each like, I'm like, hell, go all out and dress up. <laughs> and like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, there's a, um, there are games, like I, 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 I I've been in a long distance relationship for a long time. So I got used to, you know, playing games online. There's Pictionary online. Things like that that you can do are probably good. And then, man, I don't know. I don't know how long, you know, if you look at the sort of anticipation of how long this will last, we're, we're looking at completely, and I think this is important that people need to be clear about this. Our lives are not going to be the same for 12 to 18 months, right? I mean, yeah. it seems pretty clear yeah. that until we get much better treatment and probably vaccines, we're going to have to go, you know, maybe we'll get, maybe the, the cases will decline substantially and we'll loosen up a bit, but then probably we'll get spikes again and have to do more social distancing. So. Yeah. I, I, I think it depends on how they do it because if they do the Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong model, uh -huh. which is, and also South Korea now, right, is yeah, test, test everywhere. Yeah. Like you know, right. you, you walk out of one building, you walk into the one next door, you're yeah. getting tested. Like you're getting tested everywhere. And yeah. as soon as you show some signs, put you aside, and yeah. then try to find out who you're with and put them aside. Right. So if you can do that, I think the initial phase might be six weeks maybe type of thing you think in six weeks will I, I mean i'm a, okay i'm saying if you have the testing capacity ready right. okay right i'm a little pessimistic about the testing situation so far because yeah. it's been i mean almost inexcusable oh, yeah. in the united states at least um but you know what i read this interesting article and i think this is is worth thinking about which is if you if you start testing the heck out of people these tests have false positive rates. I don't. I don't know exactly what they are, but if you estimate that they're between, you know, like let's say they're one in twenty, if the base rate of the disease right now is relatively low, a lot of those tests will be false positives, and so a lot of people, people who think that they have it, don't have it. And the re mm -hmm. one reason that's problematic is because people will think that they're immune to it when they're not, right? And yeah. so that. 
that was something I, I, I mean, maybe you test the, the people twice or three times or what, I, you know, whatever it is, but. Well, okay, the, the testing, okay, I don't know so much about Singapore, I could look into that, but I heard about, and it was, this was uh, an interview that Rachel Maddow did, they were talking about the testing in China, right? Okay, so yeah. basically it was, first was a temperature test, right? They took your temperature. Mm -hmm. If it was slightly off, okay, you're coming with us. And then they tested you for flu. They tested you, and if you if you pass a test for flu, then okay, fine, go home. You got the flu. You know, take here's your flu medication. But if that did, it, you know, like so if that failed, then they, okay, now we're gonna test you for this. And finally, if you like, if you failed the flu test, if you failed the the following test, like chest X-rays, whatever, then they did the test where they shoved a cotton swab up your nose or whatever, and checked tested for COVID. So okay. they didn't test for COVID right away. It was yeah, it was testing for stuff that shows that you have it so they were monitoring people all over the place all the time so right so and then there was a, a process how they went afterwards so yeah. um i think in like if you do it in those kind of stages it might be a little bit better like i get what you mean by false positives um but at least like you know if you're taking all those other steps and ruling other stuff out first yeah and then you're getting that uh. yeah that makes sense i mean you know like can you imagine i mean we're gonna have to figure something out obviously because i can't imagine I, I mean the damage that this will will wreak on the economy if we continue you know just think about like new york city or something i just think like it's at basically like a standstill yeah. it's just it's just in phenomenal i mean it's just terrifying to think about and i, I don't know I don't know how long people will be willing to put up with this before a lot of people are just like, you know what? I don't care. I don't care. I, I it's because think of how psychologically, as you've talked about, we're in like what day seven of, of social isolation, day eight or whatever. Yeah. And like people are already losing their minds. You know? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like I said, I, I think I'm lucky in that sense, you know, because of everywhere I've worked and everywhere I've been, I've been isolated. Like I, I think the smallest place I've worked at was, uh, they're called forward operating bases in Afghanistan. So you had the, they were like the frontline bases mm -hmm. and there was about a hundred people in that one. And that was like, I was there for about a week or so, <laughs> but like, you know, like, you know, whatever, like I'm used to it for now. It's, it is obviously a little Can different you handle this for like a month though. Uh, okay. There it was, it was weird. Like, you were in the middle of a crowd. You ate in common. You ate in like a big giant, you know, cafeteria. Uh, mm -hmm. It was, you know, eight stalls and eight showers in a washroom. Um, you were in a room with someone. You like my living space was uh, ten feet by seven feet. So you know, like the construction, uh, like on construction sites, the trailers. Yeah. So like basically cut those in half and made two, like cut, like split that in half. And that was like two people. Some tents. Sometimes I slept in a tent. And uh -huh. like it was plastic dividers, and you were living like six by eight. But big, but even though we were all together, you're, everyone was like watching movies on their laptops. Every and when social media and stuff came out, people were right. like, "So you were alone, surrounded by people all the time." So yeah, it's kind of like what we're now. Like you're isolated in a crowd. Like so, I it, yes, it is different. There is no physical person that I can go talk to or play right. chess with, but you know, I can do this right thanks to technology. So, yeah, yeah cuz that that's that is an interesting thing though because as, you know, like I I live alone and, yeah. and very rarely do I do anything and see people. But once in a while I'd go to like the library just to see people. I wouldn't talk to them. I'd just like hang out in the library cuz there are people around, you know, and I think even even that sense that hey, there are people around is somehow comforting to to us as a species. <laughs> so like th this I mean, it really is. It's it's a toll on some people, a lot of people, in fact. Yeah. And like, I don't I don't know, I don't know how long people are going to be able to do it. So I I, I like the idea. We have to figure out some way of, of creating a regime that allows people to go out sometimes and interact and have some sort of economic transactions. Um, well, I mean, will, I, like even the places that are locked down, as far as I know, I understand. I think they're letting people out. Like, okay, you can go like one hour a week to go groceries and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, get your essentials. So you do have that. Like, I I know in one place I can't remember they they said you could go exercise yes. by yourself outside. So yeah, you know that, that's some of the things I've told people. It's like okay, if you if as long as you're able to go out for thirty to four thirty to sixty minutes a day, like even yeah. in a city, even a place like New York City, 
especially now, you yeah. are going to be find, able to find places where you can be alone. Yeah. You know, and if you live in rural areas, hell, go outside, go camping for a weekend. You yeah, know, right. <laughs> you know, it's going to yeah. get warmer. Like, go camping. You know, it's. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Anyways, listen, man. I don't want to keep you too long. Thanks for talking. Uh, if you got anything well, else you want to say, where people can reach you, uh, you know, anything like uh, that. Let's see. Is there anything optimistic? My, my optimistic thing, again, I'll just repeat myself a little bit because it's optimistic and it gives me some kind of hope, is that people will see other humans in society as more crucial to the, the sort of purpose that we have as a civilization. And I think about the way people are looking at health workers now, mm -hmm. even grocery workers and garbage men and people who have to do these things that we often ignore and we get in these sort of trivial debates on Twitter about what kind of pronoun should we use or whatever. And it's it's sort of nice to see yeah. people caring about these people again. And I, I hope that that kind of feeling lasts after this crisis is over. Yeah, certainly. I think after this is over, we, we all owe, like you said, not just the healthcare workers, but, you know, grocery clerk workers, yeah, people exactly. in the pharmacies, all of them. You know, yeah. We owe them all a huge, huge, you know, thank you. Well, anyways, yeah. speaking of which, thank you very much. And oh, yeah. We really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and I'll be back.